The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Why isn't Jesus on a singular list of geniuses that have ever been recorded? How could he be missed by so many who study historic genius? And then this Jesus qualify as a genius. And if he is a genius, then what exactly is his genius? Mm -hmm. And if he has a genius, what makes this genius different than Mozart or Picasso? Erwin McManus helps us understand the genius of Jesus and how he changed everything. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Sheila Walsh is with me as always, and it's it's a it's a blessing to have you today. And we think this is going to bless you. I'm excited because we have someone who's been on Life Today many times, and I have always just walked away feeling a little closer to God, Sheila. Wow. Erwin McManus is back with us. Erwin, great to have you. It is so good to be with you guys. And and I want to show the book here because it's it's got one of those titles that just gets your attention. It's the genius of Jesus. And he's talking about the man who changed everything. And so we're just we're just thrilled to have you to talk about this. And Sheila, I know you have lots of questions for Erwin because this, <laughs> this book just lit you up. I loved it. First of all, thank you for writing this book. It's it's fantastic, very thought provoking. My copy is underlined all over the place. <laughs> I love that. But I have this memory of um, being on a panel with you lots of years ago, <laughs> very traditional kind of evangelical situation. And the audience were asking questions and there were lots of gentlemen in suits beside me and every single answer they had came out of the same box. And I kind of almost knew what they were gonna say. And then you were the next one and it was like, I was like, where did you get that box? That's a different box. <laughs> it was such a fresh understanding and I wondered, where did your faith journey begin? Have you always been somebody who questioned? Well, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador, and so English was my second language. So a lot of times when people hear Erwin McManus, they don't realize that I'm actually Spanish, but my name's an alias, which <laughs> tells you I have a little bit of a, a, a colorful background. And I think sometimes when you're an outsider and learning how to work your way into a new culture, into a new world, new people, new language, it already gives you a different perspective on things. Yeah. And, and I didn't grow up in a, a religious home or anything like that. My grandfather was an atheist who taught me reincarnation. My grandmother was Roman Catholic but never went to mass and didn't trust the institutional religion. And my mom was a, kind of a searcher. She brought a Buddha home and <laughs> we were Buddhist for a season. And uh, then she started studying Judaism and she decided she was Jewish, but really she, uh, was a deist. There was a, an earthquake in Managua, and she told me she didn't, she couldn't believe in a personal God because why would he allow a tragedy like yeah. that? And 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 so I just remember having some conversations as a kid about uh, about God, about spirituality, but but really more from a searcher's perspective. And so for some reason, I'm not really sure why, but by the time I was in sixth grade, I read every book of mythology in the library. Wow. And I just started studying Greek and Roman and Norse and Egyptian mythology. And, and, and I, 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 I wondered if all these mythologies were a picture into the human story. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just trying to make sense of me. And I, I ended up in a psychiatric chair by the time I was 12 years old. And, and some of it was, I just didn't know who I was. I didn't, I never met my real father. We kind of had a story that we were told, my, my, my stepfather, uh, we were told was our real father and later we discovered he was, you know, and, and so you, you don't know who you are. Yeah. You know, I have an Irish last name, but I look Spanish. <laughs> you, you know, all these things didn't match. And, and a lot of times you don't realize that the human spirit is really designed for truth. Yes. And, and when truth doesn't match up with um, the reality we're experiencing, something breaks inside of us. Yeah. And so I, I knew early on that I was trying to make sense of my life and make sense of the world around me. And I was told that, you know, I was a straight D student, first through 12th grade. I, um, I lived inside of uh, an imaginary world. Mm -hmm. I, I was um, pretty neurotic, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm still probably <laughs> fairly neurotic. You're and, in good company here, yeah, really. <laughs> so my family didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was an underachiever in every public arena. And, and then young, and when I was young, I started taking, they started giving me IQ tests and different things. And, and, uh, and so what they told me I had the capacity for and what I was actually achieving didn't match. Wow. And, and I think I was like a lot of people, terrified that there was nothing unique inside of me, mm -hmm. that there was nothing significant, that, um, 
that there was no genius, uh, no, uh, nothing special inside of me. And so I spent my life, and you know, you, you oftentimes compensate. So I became a philosophy student and a psychology student, and psychology to understand me, philosophy to understand the meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I started studying abnormal psychology. I started studying sociopathic and narcissistic behavior patterns, <laughs> abnormal psychology. And in that, I stumbled on the phenomenon of genius. And I started wondering, you know, why, do, why are there some people in history that just seem to have almost an aberrant level of mm -hmm. intelligence or mm -hmm. creativity or talent? Mm -hmm. and, and my bigger question was, is it possible to figure out how to attain that? Wow. Is there a genius inside of all of us? Or are we just here to admire those who are geniuses? Mm -hmm. And then I crashed into Jesus. And right. It's an interesting <laughs> quote right there. Yeah, it is. I crashed into Jesus. How did that happen? It was just unexpected. Uh, I mean, frankly, I was in college studying philosophy. I get a phone call from my mom, and she's 40 years old. She'd been through some painful divorces. She calls me up, and she said, Honey, I, I want to tell you that I've become a Christian. But wow. I, I had no idea what that was. <laughs> it, you know, I, I didn't know it was even like a religious thing. Uh, she seemed happy, though. Hmm. And I was for her happiness. I was never against religion. I just never thought about it. And so when she said she was a Christian, I said, I'm so happy for you. I, I thought she joined the Peace Corps or, <laughs> you know, or had just chosen some kind of humanitarian path. Mm -hmm. And then I come home from college, and the next thing I know, she's all about this person named Jesus, and she's going to a church, and she's become religious, and, uh, and my two younger sisters are now going. And, and then my brother, who's an atheist, starts going to church. And I was the most resistant one. And my brother going to church as an atheist, I thought was so hypocritical. <laughs> I kept telling him, you're an atheist. What are you doing reading a Bible? And, and he said, you know, if I become a person of faith, it's going to be an intellectual decision, not an emotional one. And I remember telling him, you're lying. You're about to crumble. And you, you're just <laughs> making an excuse. And I felt like they were crumbling to religion or, wow. or submitting to this, um, you know, the, this thing that I didn't even know what it was. Uh, but I also knew there was something missing inside of me. Hmm. And, and so I just desperately trying, uh, started trying to find some other way to fill this vacuum in my soul. I was hoping that the answer wasn't God. <laughs> wow. I was, I, I was hoping the answer wasn't Jesus. I was hoping that maybe my girlfriend could help me find the fulfillment I needed or, or, you know, studying, you know, Socrates or Aristotle or Kant would, would fill the need in my soul or, or, or something else. And, and I remember just sitting on a, in a parking lot one day and I just sat down on the curb and I just started to cry. And, and at that time, my girlfriend was standing there. She'd never seen me cry. She'd known me for four years. And, and the reason I was crying is I realized she can't help me. Nothing that I was searching for was going to meet this longing inside of me. And I felt desperate. Mm. And I felt this overwhelming fear that everything I searched for was on the other side of faith wow. and trusting Jesus. But I didn't know who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying to me. <laughs> I mean, how do you trust someone you don't know, oh, yeah. you can't yeah. see, you've never had a conversation with that you know of? <laughs> right? You know? You know yeah. and, and, and then to... Just to add to that, I mean, I, I love the people who were a part of this church, mm -hmm. and they were really beautiful people, but they were very different than me. I, I see the world very differently. I'm, I'm, I'm an, an, an unorthodox person. I, I'm a little more abstract and maybe creative, and the church seemed very uh, standardized sure. and, and yeah. you know, and, and more um, mainstream. But you know what? Love covers a multitude of irrelevance. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> you know, they were so different than me, but they loved me, mm -hmm. and they didn't care that I was different. And, and so I, I remember the exact day. I mean, it was August 20th, 1978. I made this insane decision to entrust my life to a person I did not know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember just praying and saying, Jesus, I don't even know if you're out there, but if you are, I'm in. And... And that's actually what drove me to write this book 40 years later. Wow. I'm sitting in my back house during the quarantine, and I've always been a very, um, uh, I guess, tormented soul. I, you know, my inner world is, is always in shambles in some ways. And I started having this conversation with myself going, I can't believe that my life has been completely transformed by a person who lived 2,000 years ago. I'm, I'm having this conversation with myself mm -hmm. going, how is it possible that my whole life centers around this person named Jesus? And then I have, and I, I talk to myself a lot, and that's why I'm never lonely, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then my other person inside of me said, what if he isn't God? 
Like, what if Jesus isn't God? You've built your whole life on him. And then the other voice came back and said, well, if he isn't God, you still can't deny that you've been changed. And then I, that's where the idea of the book came from. Wait a minute. Either I've been changed by the reality of who Jesus is, or I've been changed by the idea of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's the most powerful idea then that a person could ever en embrace. Mm -hmm. So I started writing the book as if I did not believe in Jesus. Wow. I started writing the book, putting aside all my faith in Jesus and treating it like it was mythology. And then asking the question, why isn't Jesus on a singular list of geniuses that have ever been recorded? Mm -hmm. How could he be missed by so many who study historic genius? And then does Jesus qualify as a genius? And if he is a genius, then what exactly is his genius? Mm -hmm. And if he has a genius, what makes this genius different than Mozart or Picasso or Einstein is that if I spend my life with Mozart, I will not become a composer. Or if I spend my life with Picasso, I will not become a painter. Mm. Or with Einstein, I will not become a physicist or a mathematician. But if I spend my life with Jesus, his genius is transferable. Wow, because that's it, profound right because there. Because it changed me. And that's where the idea of the book came from was I wanted people to see this genius that 2,000 years later still has the power to change a person's life and translate that genius into them. Yeah, yeah, and one, one thing I find fascinating about you and others that, that have taken sort of the path that you have, those of us who grew up in the church, our starting point is Jesus, and, and I, I think that's wonderful. And then we learn about these other things and, sure. and compare it. But for someone like you, it's almost like you went through everything to get to Jesus, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you stayed there. <laughs> I'm curious, what, what are some of the specific things about Christ that you consider genius that were also the things that made you think, I made the right decision by trusting my life to someone that you didn't previously know? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the first thing for me that happened was I actually wanted to be the best version of myself, even when no one was watching. Mm -hmm. And that really confused me. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I, I understand the utilitarian need to be a good person, right? And you have to earn trust, you have to be trusted, just even economically to be a good business person, to, uh, to function in a, in a marriage or to be a good parent. You, you have to have level, levels of trust and relationship. But what was really odd to me was I actually wanted to be good regardless of what anyone else thought about me. And... and and so for myself, on, uh, in my inner world, I thought, what happened to me? Like, I understand that humility is better than arrogance, mm. but I didn't understand how suddenly I longed to be humble. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I actually longed to be kind and to have compassion mark my life. And so a huge part of it for me was my own internal world. I mean, one of the things that you kind of hear in the the space of human dynamics is people never change. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a pretty common view. And I've never been able to have that view because I changed. Yeah. And I don't think I'm the singular exception in the world. Right. <laughs> right? Oh, no, and so I, I believe people can change and that people do change, mm -hmm. which makes you incredibly optimistic, even in the worst case scenarios. And, and so a part of what I felt was a part of the genius of Jesus was the person that I actually longed to become. It's, it's not just about right and wrong and, you know, what you do and, you know, uh, what you can eliminate from your life and, and how other people think about you and even your reputation. It's actually about the, the, the deepest motivation of, of your soul. You, you, you didn't say act good or act kind. You said be good or yeah. be kind. I mean, am I picking up on something? Yeah, that's here? right. No, that's exactly right, because I think everyone can do a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, sure. know? you can take a moment and be generous or take a moment, even be sacrificial or heroic. It's a different thing when that becomes a longing yeah. of who you want to become. You want to become the best version of yourself. Yeah, or... that's transformational. That's not just... So let me just make it clear at this point. I have <laughs> 73 questions, and I'm clearly <laughs> going to get to two of them. Um, and that is why you need this book for yourself, because honestly, some of the things you talk about... I wanted to point to a couple. Mm -hmm. You talk about the genius of power. Mm -hmm. And you actually reference one of my favorite movies, Cool Hand Look, where the <laughs> rules were changed and how Jesus right. changed the rules. Mm -hmm. what did, how, how did that speak to you? By the way, it's probably my most influential movie of my really? life. Really? Because you guys, you know, you grew up in faith, you grew up in church maybe. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. <laughs> so I had movies and books. 
<laughs> and so when my son was maybe 10 years old, I said, I want, I want you to, I want to introduce you to the movies and books that shaped the way I think and mm -hmm. shaped, shaped me as a person. Cool Hand Luke was one of those. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's because Cool Hand Luke for me became a study in how I could never lose my power even when I felt powerless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it's a really strong Christ metaphor. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in many ways, Cool Hand Luke prepared me for the Gospel of John. Nice. Wow. And how Jesus would be the one who uh, reframed power. Mm -hmm. And, and the, to me, what's amazing is when you talk about things like um, social justice or uh, reparations for, for past uh, crimes against other um, uh, peoples, whether it's uh, the Native Americans or the Maori in, mm. in, um, in New Zealand or right. the Aboriginal in, mm. in, in Australia, these conversations we don't realize are actually influenced by Jesus, by his genius. Mm. See, before Jesus, no nation thought they should owe who they conquered anything. Mm. You just conquered nations, that's just the way it was. Well, you, you, weren't, yeah. you never had a conversation <laughs> about slavery being unethical or immoral. Mm. What we don't realize is that Jesus actually transformed our view of power, where now we expect nations to use power to empower, not to overpower. Mm. We expect nations to actually move toward justice and move toward social equality and move toward um, righteousness. Mm. But that framework didn't exist in the Roman Empire. Mm -mm. That frame didn't exist with Genghis Khan. Mm. It didn't exist with Cleopatra or with even Alexander the Great. And what we need to realize is that framework of power has actually been changed by the life of Jesus. Wow. He changed the way we see power. Mm -hmm. And he also teaches us how to use power. You know, I'm probably the most powerful metaphor in the Bible is when it says that Jesus knew that all authority and all power had been given to him. And then what he does right after that is he puts a towel around his waist and he washes his disciples' feet. Mm -hmm. And so what the scriptures are actually giving us is how Jesus uses power. And what you learn in the scriptures is that uh, God only trusts his power to those who are committed to serve. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old... Um, adage that says that absolute power corrupts absolutely, but it's not true because God has absolute power and he's incorruptible. Mm -hmm. And so I realized, no, absolute power doesn't corrupt absolutely. Absolute power reveals absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. See, absolute power reveals to you who mm -hmm. you really are and to others. Because mm -hmm. what happens so oftentimes is that when we have that, that power, we don't have a character that actually navigates that power well. And Jesus reframes it. He says, no, power is not to be used for your personal benefit when you've been given power to stewardship to serve others. Mm. Wow, it's beautiful. Jeez, okay, uh, we've got a, just a very little bit of time left, but <laughs> what, what do people need to know that they will walk away with when they, this is, this is a little bit heady stuff, and, and I like it for that, but there's a practical aspect to it. What are people gonna get when they, when they read the book? You know, it, it's heady stuff, but the book is written from the heart. And so it's accessible to everyone. It's a good distinction. Yeah. And um, what a, it's, a very, it's a very personal book. It's, it carries a lot of my own personal journey. And uh, what I would say is that this book allows people who believe in Jesus to have a fresh and new perspective on the extraordinary nature of who Jesus is mm -hmm. and how who he is changes us, mm -hmm. how his genius can be translated in your life. But it's also a book that's written for a person that does not believe. If you have friends that don't believe in God or are not yet um, willing to trust Jesus with their lives, this book will allow them to experience Jesus from an entirely different frequency, from a new narrative. And I think it, it, it makes Jesus so compelling that people that you thought were not open will become open for the first time. You're out, you're out in Hollywood. I am. I and live so in Hollywood. So you're, you're preaching this in a place where a lot of people are like you. You know, they, they hadn't, didn't grow up with Jesus. What are you seeing in the lives of people when they start to get this? What I find is that when people get a clear picture of Jesus, they're absolutely drawn to him. Mm -hmm. It's just that sometimes the lens of religion, the lens of, of even the church, the lens of Christianity, sure. has blurred for people the beauty of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just want to, uh, in a sense, I want to uh, clean the glass so that people can see through us to the extraordinary nature of who Jesus is. Well, that's great. So you're going to want to get the book for yourself. You'll find out which part of Cool Hand Luke spoke to Erwin <laughs> so deeply as it did to me. You'll also hear some really interesting stories and encounter with Ben Affleck that is very, very revealing. But first of all, we would love to you to um, help us with something that we feel passionately about. There's a lot of young girls at the moment who have been held captive, who have been um, taken into sex slavery, and we here at Life are determined to be part of the good news that comes to their lives. Would you watch this? There are dangers in this world we see every day. 
in the news that impact the lives of thousands of people. But there is a hidden danger, rarely seen by most of us. It destroys the lives of innocent children and young girls by enslaving them in the hidden world of human trafficking. A human trafficker came through here many months ago and promised uh, this young lady's sister uh, a better life, lured her away, and they haven't heard from her. She's, as far as they know, gone. They have her picture, and they have a prayer that she'll come back, a hope that they will see her again. This is the reality here and in places all over, all over the world. That's why rescue life is critical. Uh, we must first reach into places like this with education so that they'll know what to look out for when these predators come through. We must rescue the girls that we can and get them out of the sex trade. And we must restore them. We must give them a hope and a future. We can do that. We can do it on a larger scale, but we have to have your help. I pray that you will Help us as we try to help so many girls. We have to stop this abuse, it's not right. You can do something. Join with us as we rescue life. I remember some of those faces really, really well on one of our trips to Southeast Asia. And through partners on the ground, three young girls had agreed, they said they wanted to talk to us. And there was this one moment um, uh, not long before we were going, where I had stopped in at like a gas station and got a packet of Oreos. And I remember sitting in the, on the dirt with these three young girls, all eating Oreos, like little girls are supposed to do, with the knowledge that that night they would be back in that same brothel and that we hadn't been able to reach them yet. And I remember going back to my hotel room and just laying on the carpet and just sobbing, I felt so powerless. And I felt like they're out there right now and they're like, I mean, they could be my daughter. And but yeah, I felt the, the Holy Spirit say to me, shall I get up and dry your face and do something? And so that's why we're bringing these stories to you because this is going on right now. And so often it, feel, it feels like it's another world and it's not like our family. If you could sit with these little girls and look in their eyes, and talk to them and have a normal moment with them, you would see they're just like your daughter. They're just like my sister. So we have this commitment. We have some amazing people who have said during this season, they want to step up and help us. And they're actually putting up like $320,000 to match um, gifts. And honestly, Randy, I, the figures, it's very doable for each one of us. If we all do something, then, then we can we can change oh, everything. Absolutely, and it's it's actually not that hard because, as you mentioned, we have the people in place. And you know, the thing that that bothers me as the father of daughters is the powerlessness that that we feel in, in a situation where you just you're almost like God. Can you just walk right in and just? rid the world of this stain. And, and I hear the father saying, I, that's why I've sent you. Now we can't all go and thank goodness we don't have to because it is, it is very difficult. But you can go when you join with us. Normally it, it, it costs $128 to reach just one child or, or to restore or to rescue a child. But now through this wonderful, beautiful, generous matching grant of some of our top donors, your gift of $64 will reach that child. And many of you can do much more. I, 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 there's some of you that can reach right now uh, 20 children, 20 children, a gift of $1,280. And we have gifts, uh, I do want to mention, by the way, uh -huh. Sheila's wonderful book, Holding On When You Want to Let Go. And we, what this is about, this is about giving you hope as you reach out and give hope to others. This is what we're called to do. This is how we represent Christ to the world. We reach those who seem unreachable and restore them with the love of Christ. I hope you'll join us today. Do what you can. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too large. Go to the phone or go online right now and help us as we rescue these precious children. Innocent children and young people longing to be loved and cared for. 
are being abducted and sold at the hands of violent predators, forced into the evil industry of human trafficking. Through Mission Rescue Life, you can reach out to educate children at risk of being trafficked, rescue those already enslaved, and restore young lives, giving them a future. With a generous $320,000 matching gift, now your gift of $128 to help reach, rescue, or restore one child can be doubled to help two children. Your $64 gift will be matched to help save one child from the horrors of human trafficking. And a $32 Mission Rescue gift will be doubled to $64. With your gift today, we'll send you Sheila Walsh's brand new book, Holding On When You Want to Let Go, a lifeline of hope for those who feel their life is falling apart. With your gift of $128 or more, you'll receive the Beauty Out of Ashes puzzle set, featuring an image taken by our team while on a trip to the mission field. This 500-piece puzzle forms a beautiful portrait of hope in the midst of despair. Included is a 24-piece puzzle for your children and grandchildren. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,280, which will now help rescue 20 children, and you may request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Divine Servant. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Do go online or go to the phones right now and give the best gift you can. We, we covet your support for the kingdom of God. And Sheila, I'd love for people to pick up Erwin's book. Yeah, and just remember, for any gift at all, request Erwin's book, The Genius of Jesus, and we will be thrilled to send it to you. I just want to say how grateful I am for you. I'm grateful for your questions, for your wrestling, mm -hmm. for your endless pursuit. And, and we are the ones who get to, to receive from that. So thank you, Erwin. Oh, thank you so much. It's awesome. And we love you, and we will see you next time on Life Today. God bless you. your life to your father the one who help you see won't leave you recklessly come to me I'll be your Are you concerned about your family being ill-equipped to manage resources when you pass away? Do you want to leave a legacy gift that impacts the lives of others? As a free service to our friends and partners, Life Planning Services, a ministry of Life Outreach International, is here to help with your estate planning needs and chart your financial future. Do not put off this important step to protect your loved ones and leave a lasting legacy. Contact Life Planning Services today. And that's why I cannot give up. Our timing is not God's timing. Learning what to do while trusting God in seasons of waiting. Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.